In last week's episode, we talked about eBay and how it rose in popularity because people wanted a way to buy and sell things on the internet. Remember, Beanie Babies were all the rage and people started wanting to buy and sell everything that they could online. The thing was, people still didn't really trust buying things through websites yet. It was just so new. A lot of early eBay transactions were sent via money order or check through the physical mail. (laughs) Can you imagine all the logistical issues that came with that? Yeah, I don't want to go back to the 1990s either. Well, slowly but surely, technologies started emerging that allowed people to make online transactions and people began to adopt them, especially with eBay. Today's company helped change the game for eBay, but then it grew into more, much more. Welcome to Stock Stories. Welcome to the Stock Stories Podcast. My name is Alex Mason, and I am your host and stock storyteller. On this show, we decode the business behind the stock in order to help you make better investing decisions. We also learn about mental models and investing principles in order to complement stock analysis. Now, we're going through the entire S&P 500, and we are going to keep going with that today. Thanks so much for joining me. And if you were with us last week, you know that we talked about eBay. We kind of went into that company, the famous e-commerce company, looked at its history, its business model, where it's at. We looked at stock performance, financials. We just did everything related to eBay. And I love doing this podcast in part because it gives me and you the opportunity to just look under the hood of these companies and really understand what's going on with them. Are they a worthwhile investment today? Were they a worthwhile investment in the past? And more importantly, why or why not? Because by uncovering the reasons why an investment is attractive or isn't attractive, that's what actually helps us grow as investors, right? So thanks for joining me again today. And we're going to look at another company in the S&P 500. This one has a history that's really tied to eBay in a big way, but uh, let's go ahead and just get into it. Let's talk about PayPal. All right, let's talk about PayPal, ticker symbol PYPL. Now, the company was founded by Peter Thiel, Luke Nozak, Max Levchin. These three men founded a company called Confinity. And Confinity came from this idea to combine the words confidence and infinity. (laughs) Kind of an interesting name. But their initial idea was to create security software for Palm Pilots, which were becoming a big technology around the late 1990s, specifically in 1998. Now, if you don't know what a Palm Pilot is, it was kind of this little device. It looked kind of like a smartphone, actually. But just think about a super, super simple version of a phone. It allowed you to wirelessly communicate with other people. And it was one of the first devices ever that actually allowed you to transfer money from one person to another. It was pretty revolutionary, pretty cutting edge, and not a lot of people had them, but they were becoming more popular in the business world around this time. So they decided to create some kind of security software for this device. But the thing is, it didn't really work out that well. 
So they decided to tweak their approach. Instead of focusing on security, they decided to create an electronic wallet, which they called PayPal. They knew that the internet was going to change the way that people transacted forever. They knew that commerce was going to change. And so they figured, okay, people have physical wallets and they use cash to buy things at stores. We can change the game on the internet by creating this digital or electronic wallet. So they managed to strike a deal with eBay, which was this emerging e-commerce giant at the time. And they found some success on that platform. People wanted to use this electronic wallet to buy things on eBay. And over time, people started to trust this PayPal brand. Over time, one in five transactions on eBay were using PayPal. Meanwhile, in 1999, there was a man named Elon Musk. He was starting up a company called X.com, which was an online bank. Now, he had recently sold his first company called Zip2 to Compaq earlier that year and became a multimillionaire. So he was starting this company, and this company, X.com, began competing with Confinity in the online space. Now, they both offered incentives to try to get people to sign up for online banking, which you have to remember, this is the late 1990s. People did not trust the internet, especially when it came to things like money transfers. <laughs> so this was a totally new concept at the time. So they had to kind of bribe people to sign up for accounts. For example, you could get $5 or $10 to sign up with either service. And you would even get referral bonuses if you convince other people to sign up and get accounts. So Peter Thiel, one of the founders of Confinity, he noticed Musk's X.com was beginning to thrive and so they ultimately decided to join forces and merge their two companies. They figured, hey, we were probably going to be better together if we just work together instead of competing with each other. The companies merged in the year 2000. The company was still called Confinity, but the main focus was on PayPal as a product. Problems started to brew, though. Now, Thiel, Musk, and other board members they started to disagree about how the company should be run. For example, what technology should the business focus on? Should they focus on Microsoft? Should they focus on Linux? And this was just one of many issues that the leaders of the company struggled with. They were in this new space trying to figure everything out. They were kind of swimming upstream in a big sense because, like I said, people just didn't trust online banking that much. And even though they were getting explosive user growth, they we're trying to figure out how to manage it and how to focus the direction of their company. Now, Musk, who was the CEO of X.com, he ended up getting replaced by a different CEO. And then that person was later removed and Musk became CEO again, with Peter Thiel becoming CEO later and Musk leaving the company, where he would then go on to focus on other businesses like Tesla. There was a big shift in management back and forth during this time. And you had a lot of these really intelligent personalities that were trying to run things. And the company struggled because it didn't have clear leadership for a time. But eventually, things settled down and Teal ended up becoming the CEO. The company was renamed PayPal to focus on the main product at this time. And in 2002, the company had its initial public offering. Now remember, an initial public offering is when a company, quote unquote, goes public. It's when they actually have stock on a stock exchange that people like you and I can buy. And it's a way that a company can raise money in order to expand. Now this was significant at the time because the 2000 to 2002 period was a really rough period for companies that were in the tech sector. The dot-com bust proved to be pretty devastating to many internet-based businesses, and PayPal was actually the first internet IPO in almost a year in the wake of the tech bust. Now, they ended up getting snapped up by eBay, their biggest customer, and eBay paid up for them. They bought PayPal for $1.5 billion in October 
of the same year. As the 2000s went on, payment processing became a bigger and more important space within the landscape of the internet. The company just kept growing because more and more people were comfortable with buying things online and they needed a safe and secure way to do it. So this electronic wallet that PayPal offered, it was perfect for them. So they started using it and then PayPal kept growing and growing. In 2007, PayPal made a partnership with MasterCard so that sites that didn't have direct integration with PayPal could still accept it. And that was a big move. By 2010, PayPal had grown to an incredible 100 million active users in 190 markets. The company had successfully leveraged the internet to become a relevant payment solution, not just in the United States, but in countries all over the world. And then by 2012, the company actually accounted for 40% of eBay's revenue. It really had grown into a great company of its own. Around this time, an investor named Carl Icahn started to proclaim that he wanted PayPal spun off from eBay and that they should operate as separate businesses. Now, Icahn is what is known as an activist investor. What does this mean? Well, an activist investor is someone who usually owns a large percentage of a company. And even though they themselves are not running the business, they're able to exert a large amount of influence on how it's run based on the fact that they own a lot of shares of the company. For example, they can appoint a board member if they want to to help run the company or actually have their opinion heard at an annual shareholder meeting. Being an activist investor means that you have a lot more influence than just your typical investor. And activist investors are usually pretty, well, active in trying to get the company to go a certain direction. And that's exactly what Carl Icahn was trying to do here. Icahn was relentless in voicing his opinion. And eventually in 2015, eBay's management decided, okay, we're gonna do this thing. They executed a tax-free spinoff of PayPal's business to its shareholders. A spinoff is just when one company takes one of its business units and separates it from its other business units. It kind of splits it into different pieces. This way, both businesses are theoretically more nimble and able to operate more efficiently. Now, it doesn't always work out this way, but sometimes in the case of PayPal, it did. The way that the spinoff worked was that each eBay shareholder got one PayPal share for each eBay share that they owned. So this transaction was pretty straightforward. Oh, and one more thing about spinoffs, most of the time, they're completely tax-free. So if you were an eBay shareholder at the time, you wouldn't have had to pay any taxes at all, and you would have magically seen some shares of PayPal in your account one day. Pretty cool, huh? So what does PayPal do? We've talked about the history, and now let's get into the actual business model of PayPal today. What is this company, and why should we care about it? Well, they are a payment processor. They help people send and receive money in dozens of different currencies all over the world. And the way that they work is they serve both merchants and consumers. So people want to sell things online. People want to buy things online. PayPal connects them. But what is it that makes PayPal different from other similar companies like other companies we've covered on the podcast before, like Visa or MasterCard or other newer entrants to the payment space like Square? Companies like Visa and MasterCard are similar in that they facilitate digital transactions between merchants and consumers. Now, historically, they have done this using credit cards and a highly secured network that works with banks. Well, PayPal doesn't have a card network. Instead, they use encryption technology to track payments back and forth between customers and merchants. Now, Square is another competitor. They facilitate payments too. For example, they help small businesses accept credit card transactions as opposed to cash. And let's not forget about other competitors that have emerged in recent years, like Apple Pay or Google Pay, which 
each have their own money transfer technologies. Okay, so I still haven't really answered the question about what makes PayPal different. The reality is that in 2021, the lines are blurring very quickly between all of these financial technology companies. One thing that PayPal does that differentiates itself is that it has a wide array of offerings. They do a lot of things. They do traditional customer to merchant transactions, for example, and they also do peer to peer payments. Peer to peer payments, that's just like if you and I go out to a restaurant and we want to split the bill, but I don't have any cash on me, I can just send you a payment via PayPal and that's it. We're good. So they do a little bit of everything in a way as far as online transactions go. Another thing that PayPal has going for it is that they also tend to have higher transaction limits than other players. For example, you can send over $10,000 in a single transaction and not every payment solution is able to do transactions that high. I think of PayPal as kind of the biggest pure play publicly traded payment processing company. Now sure, many other companies process payments too, but except for other companies like Square, who's a direct competitor, PayPal's main business has been payments for a very long time. A lot of these other companies are just kind of coming into payments and trying to compete in a space that they're relatively new at. PayPal's been doing this for a long time. PayPal has over 377 million active accounts in its network, and they operate in over 200 markets worldwide. So yeah, this is an international business. What are some of the brands that PayPal owns? Now, of course, they have the brand PayPal, but other than that, they also offer other services through brands that they have acquired over the years. And here are some of them. There's Venmo. Venmo has over 40 million users, and they also have this feature that is an optional debit card feature that allows you to take money out, but not do it on credit. So that example that I just mentioned where you and I would go out to a restaurant and I would pay you money for my fair share of the meal. Well, yeah, I would probably use a service like Venmo. And Zoom, which is spelled X-O-O-M, this is an international money transfer service. So if I want to send money to some family across the border somewhere, then I could use this service. And they also have a brand called Honey, which they acquired for $4 billion in 2019. This is an interesting acquisition because it's on the consumer money saving side. Honey is something that started out as a browser extension on your computer that works with the internet basically to find deals across thousands of merchants and then when you go to check out with the merchant it automatically applies the best coupon code to your purchase so paypal clearly wants to better understand the data behind customer purchases and not just be the one who makes the transaction they want to gain more insight into the entire buying process and so that was something that was really interesting when they acquired Honey. So you can see that they've gotten into all these different businesses, mostly with money transfers, but they're expanding into other aspects of the e-commerce landscape too. Now, the way that PayPal actually makes money is that they take a cut of all of these transactions. That's basically how all of these types of businesses work. People sell things and then PayPal says, okay, well, we're going to take a certain percentage somewhere, maybe around 2.9%, somewhere around 3%. And then maybe there is some fees here and there for different types of transactions, depending on the situation. So PayPal really makes its money through fees and they're kind of like this toll road. A toll road is a type of business model where people kind of have to go through a certain road and then they have to pay someone to gain access. And that's kind of what PayPal's business model is. People want to pay other people and they want to do it on their phone. They want to do it instantly and they want to do it conveniently and securely. And PayPal offers that. So if you can pay someone just a very small cut of a sale, then yeah, you're going to want to offer that 
service to your consumers because it's super convenient and ultimately you'll have more sales than if you went with some kind of older technology. All right, now let's take a look at the financials. We understand now where PayPal came from. We understand what they do. Now let's look at what they make. Now, analyzing the numbers is always important as an investor because we want to see, is the company actually making money? And what does the growth trajectory look like for this business? Now, for the sake of comparison, I'm going to be looking at two different years of fiscal data, 2013 to 2020. And yes, PayPal was not publicly traded in 2013. It was still part of eBay, but we can still look at the numbers from that time period in order to better understand how the growth profile has progressed for this business. So first, let's look at the income statement, which tells us how much money the company made in terms of income, in terms of sales. So first, let's look at sales. In 2013, PayPal made just under $7 billion in sales. So it was already a pretty big business back then. But in 2020, that number tripled. Now PayPal is making over $21 billion in sales. This is an 18% annual growth rate in sales. Very fast growth. Very nice growth there. Solid double digit growth. But is this translated into the profits? So let's look at the net income. In 2013, PayPal was making about $950 million in profit. So pretty profitable there. And then in 2020, they made over $4 billion in profit. And that's over 23% annual growth rate in the profits of this business. So you can see PayPal has been highly profitable and they've been growing their profits at a high rate. Now, did this translate into earnings per share? Yes, it did. PayPal was making 78 cents per share in 2013, and now they're making over $3.54, and that's as of 2020. So that's a 24% annual growth rate in earnings per share, which is great news for shareholders because that's a really nice growth rate. Okay, let's look at the balance sheet, which tells us what the company owns versus what they owe. Now, first I like to look at the cash. Cash is a good indicator of how much a business is actually successful at running its business and making profits. I really like to see increase in cash balances with companies I'm thinking about investing in. So in 2013, PayPal had just under $2 billion in cash. And by 2020, that number multiplied substantially to over $13 billion. So this is a company that's been growing their cash pile. Now, what about the debt? Remember, debt can cripple a business if there's too much of it. Now, the good thing about 2013 was that the company actually didn't have any long-term debt, and they didn't have long-term debt for many years. In fact, not until 2019 did they start borrowing. In 2020, the company had just under $9 billion in long-term debt, so they did increase their debt substantially but still very reasonable relative to their cash balance and relative to their profits. And then lastly, let's look at the cash flow part of the financials. Operating cash flow increased from $2 billion to almost $6 billion. Investing cash flow went from almost $2 billion to over $16 billion. So this is a company that's investing a lot in their business now, way more than they were before. And then financing cash flow has also increased substantially. And that's mainly because they recently started taking out lots of debt. So that's the main reason the financing cash flow has increased. Now, one thing also to note is the shares outstanding. Notice how with the earnings per share that I mentioned earlier, it's grown at pretty much the same rate as the overall profits has grown. That means that the shares outstanding has been relatively flat. It, the company hasn't been issuing a lot of shares or buying back a lot of shares. So this is a good thing for shareholders. That means that we're making the same profits as owners that the business itself is making because the company isn't just constantly raising money by issuing shares. So that's something that is relatively good for us as potential shareholders. All right, let's talk about 
the synthesis here. Let's wrap this up and kind of put all this information together to try to come up with an assessment. So here are my thoughts on PayPal after looking at all of this. Now, based on the numbers I'm seeing, this is definitely a fast growing business that's turning into a stalwart. It's turning into a blue chip company, in my opinion. Now, for a business that was already a decent size when it was an eBay subsidiary in 2013, to grow consistently above 20% per year, I mean, that's impressive. The share price of the company right now, as I'm recording this in late August 2021, it's about $278 per share. And the recent 12 months of earnings, that's $4.10 per share. So that's a valuation using a price to earnings ratio, remember we're taking the price of the share divided by the earnings per share, that's a valuation of 67 times earnings. (laughs) That's pretty high. So, okay, it's not cheap, but it's clearly an excellent business. Another metric that I like to look at, as you know if you listen to this podcast for a while, is return on equity. Return on equity measures how good management is at creating profit from the business's assets and specifically the equity so equity remember that's assets minus liability it's basically the net worth of the company now return on equity of paypal it's around the high 20s so 20 ish percent but it used to be in the low teens now the return on equity has recently been juiced up by leverage because the company's been borrowing more money and it's putting up impressive numbers So that's another thing to note there. Now, honestly, I don't know how much to pay for a business like this, but I do know that 50 or 60 times earnings is not it. (laughs) I mean, here's the reason. There's a lot of competition in the payment space right now. And although I think PayPal is in a great position, I would like them to be at a more reasonable valuation before I consider the price to be in the realm of a margin of safety here. Now, PayPal investors have done really well since the spinoff. That being said, now, since the IPO, this stock has crushed the S&P 500 index, compounding at an incredible rate of 43% annually. I mean, that is absolutely incredible. You could have put in a few thousand dollars into PayPal stock around the time of the IPO and made lots of money, made many thousands of dollars in returns. But I do want to make an important point here. It's important to note that most of your returns up to this point came in the most recent 18 or so months during the pandemic. And that's when digital payments have become seen by Wall Street as increasingly important. Now, the stock more than tripled over just this time frame, just the past 18 months or so. Now, if we look at the pre-pandemic prices of the stock, PayPal traded at around $100 per share. Now, based on the 2021 earnings that we can expect, that's a valuation of just 24 times earnings. Now, that is looking pretty attractive to me because a company growing at 24% per year, trading at 24 times earnings, I mean, that's pretty much, uh, (laughs) I mean, I don't want to make blanket statements here, but that would definitely get me more interested into doing even more due diligence on this business because that's a pretty strong growth profile relative to the valuation, especially in an interest rate environment like today where interest rates are super low. So that would be pretty attractive to me personally. So maybe that day will come again. But as much as I like PayPal, I'm not willing to pay nearly this much for this level of growth. So if PayPal returns to pre-pandemic prices, send me an email and let me know. (laughs) I might have to take a look again. Hey, thanks so much for listening to the Stock Stories Podcast. I'm your host and stock storyteller, Alex Mason. This show was written and produced by me. Sound design done by the incredibly talented Janelle Leon. 
And also, thank you to the lovely Selenia Caraveo for helping keeping things running smoothly behind the scenes. If you enjoyed this episode, consider sharing it with a friend. The way that this show grows is if you like it and you like it enough to tell people about it. So let's work together to help other investors learn about great businesses and buy stocks smarter. Now, if you like this episode and want even more, maybe you want to listen to all of the stocks in the archive or you want bonus content such as episodes on stocks that are not in S&P 500, consider joining Stock Stories Premium. This is where I put my absolute best investment ideas and thinking and where we explore more companies. Check it out by clicking the link in the show notes. So thanks in advance for sharing the show and considering becoming a premium subscriber. I really appreciate it. So until next time, what's your stock story? Hey, it's Alex. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Thank you so much for listening to Stock Stories. Consider joining Stock Stories Premium. It's essentially a private podcast where you can listen to the entire archive of the show, always ad-free. And in addition to that, I'll be providing bonus episodes, bonus stock stories for you to listen to. And these are companies that you won't find in the S&P 500. These are other companies that offer interesting opportunities for potential investment. And I promise to always do the same due diligence and level of analysis that I do with all of my stock stories. So you can be assured of that. So consider joining Stock Stories Premium. You can find out more at stockstoryteller.com. Again, that's stockstoryteller.com. And I'll be continuing to provide new free content here on this show every single week, no matter what, whether or not you decide to join. But if you are ready to take that next step in your investing journey, consider joining Stock Stories Premium. Again, that's at stockstoryteller.com. Thank you.